Welcome to Longevity Now, Longevity Now FL. Uh, I'm Luigi Fontana, the scientific director of the Charles Perkins Center RPA Clinic and Longevity Program of the University of Sydney. So today uh, I'm going to try to basically summarize what we know about the beneficial effects of vitamin D and vitamin D supplementation uh, in promoting health. Okay, so I'm going to divide my talk uh, in uh, different parts. And at the beginning, I'm going to discuss the epidemiological evidence and then what the randomized clinical trials they have confirmed. That's a very important concept because a lot of people confuse the results of epidemiological data with those of randomized clinical trial. The uh, epidemiological data are just suggesting, they're not proving, proving cause-effect relationship as I'm gonna explain in a second. Okay, so let's start. So the evidence from epidemiological studies uh, suggest that uh, people with uh, uh, higher plasma levels of uh, vitamin D, they have a reduced risk of developing bone fractures, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, dementia, depression, and autoimmune diseases, okay? But Again, associations do not prove causations. I already explained in many of my videos uh, this concept. Uh, and the reason is that even if we adjust for multiple confounding factors uh, in these uh, uh, epidemiological studies, we cannot really establish causation because, uh, for example, people with higher level of vitamin D, Typically, they exercise more, they eat healthier diets. Uh, and, you know, with this uh, food frequency questionnaire, it's very difficult, you know, to exactly measure what people are eating day by day. They spend more time outdoors, and that's very difficult to control for. And therefore, they have higher exposure to UV rate. But, you know, it's difficult to understand, basically, this cause-effect relationship. Therefore, the gold standard to demonstrate that something is improving a certain medical condition or health condition is the randomized clinical trial, where you uh, divide a, a population in a group that takes a placebo or no, con no, no intervention, another one where you know you give them an, an intervention. In this, this instance is a, a supplement with vitamin D, D, D3, okay? So to summarize, the results of large randomized clinical trials uh, in generally healthy, and that's important, in people who are healthy, uh, middle age and older adults, did not, not, did not show a significant protective effect of vitamin D supplementation in reducing cardiovascular disease, diabetes, dementia, cancer, and even bone fractures. There is a paper published this year in New England Journal of Medicine, Le Boff. This is the vital trial. It's a large trial. I'm going to tell you in a second. Uh, uh, this, this trial found that vitamin D3 supplementation did not result in a significant lower risk of fractures than placebo among generally healthy midlife and older adults who were not selected for vitamin D deficiency, low bone mass, or osteoporosis. Okay? So these are the results of randomized clinical trial that in some way they are in disagreement with uh, epidemiological data for many of these chronic disease. However, these randomized clinical trials have shown, clearly shown, demonstrated that basically uh, uh, autoimmune diseases and uh, advanced metastatic cancer, fatal cancers, in these two uh, conditions, vitamin D supplementation 
is significantly reducing the risk of uh, developing these two diseases, okay? So this is the paper published this year uh, in, uh, in, in BMJ, showing these the results of, of the large vital randomized clinical trial. People uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this study, you know, it was basically 25,871 uh, uh, men and women randomized to with a two by two uh, to placebo or vitamin D supplementation, 2,000 units per day, or omega-3 fatty acids, 1,001 gram per day, or a combination of vitamin D and omega-3. And what we are finding is that people who uh, uh, took vitamin D, 2,000 units per day, uh, follow for 5.3 years had a 22% significant reduction in autoimmune diseases. Instead of those who have been supplemented with omega-3 uh, didn't have a significant reduction. There was a reduction, but it was not statistical significant. Okay, so vitamin D is significantly protecting against autoimmune diseases. A, a, another study, again, from the VITAL uh, uh, randomized clinical trial published in JAMA Network Open shows that basically uh, vitamin D, 2,000 units per day of vitamin D3 supplementation is significantly by, there is a 17% lower risk of developing uh, advanced cancer, metastatics or fatal, fatal cancers, not for invasive cancer by itself. It was not significant, but for advanced cancer, yes, it was a 17% lower risk, especially in people with a normal BMI, with a BMI less than 20, 25. In these people, basically, there was a, a almost 40% reduction in the risk of developing advanced cancer in those who receive the 2,000 units per day of vitamin D. And a meta-analysis of several randomized clinical trials with smaller, even smaller doses of vitamin D between 400 and 800 units per day confirmed that for advanced cancer, there is a protective effect of supplementation with vitamin D. Now, so the question is, then what should I do? So uh, I cannot stress enough that the most important stuff you can do is to find a very good and competent doctor. So don't follow influencer bloggers and uh, you know your friend, your personal trainer. You need to find a good doctor, an expert, who is going to, first of all, make a diagnosis. Why? Because he has to uh, uh, exclude that you have a vitamin D, D deficiency or you have a disease that uh, poses you at high risk of vitamin D deficiency. For example, of course, you know, this is just general advice. You know, it doesn't substitute, you know, your relationship with your doctor. So these are just general advices. Uh, 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 as a doctor, I can tell you that people that have uh, diets that are restricted, that are limited, may have vitamin D deficiency. People that are regularly avoiding sun exposures or spend little or no time outdoor and uh, many people nowadays they are uh, uh, spending very little time outdoor they spend most of their day in the office especially in winter in long winters in northern in northern northern europe northern america uh, patients with malabsorption so people with celiac disease chronic disease post gastric bypass surgery they, they they are higher risk of having vitamin deficiency. People with osteoporosis uh, and hyperparathyroidism, uh, hypo or hypercalcemia or hypophosphatemia, they should be checked uh, uh, 
by a good doctor, you know, to understand what's going on. People with chronic renal disease or, or, or transplant recipients, they also have to be screened and, uh, and to understand, uh, you know, what is the vitamin D, calcium and PTH levels. Uh, there are medications that are lowering the absorption of vitamin D, like uh, anti-epileptic drugs. And people, they are underestimating that, you know, uh, 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 genetically we've been selected uh, uh, based on where we live, the latitude, you know, in terms of uh, uh, melanin concentration in our skin. And uh, for example, Africans, especially from Central Africa, uh, that have very high concentration of melanin. It's very clear, you know, and uh, and and uh, they 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 the this melanin basically is so efficient in absorbing uh, UV uh, UVB rays that in these people the production of vitamin D three is uh, 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 is reduced by. 93 to 90 97 percent uh, basically this protection uh, is uh, of having a very dark skin is similar to uh, using all day long a, a sunscreen with a spf of 15 or 30 instead of people for example with uh, very fair skin blonde eye blonde blonde hair uh, red hair uh, blue eyes those people they have very low melanin and for these people the uh, exposure to uh, lower concentration of uvb is enough to produce lots of vitamin d so again, you know, if you have a very dark skin and you live in a country with a very low uh, UV uh, exposure because of the latitude, uh, you are at higher risk of having vitamin D uh, deficiency. So therefore, your doctor should, based on multiple uh, pathological and physiological factors, decide if you need to be tested for vitamin D levels in your blood uh, and if you need a supplement, okay? And um, now, what about healthy people, people that they don't have deficiencies? So for these people, uh, the, uh, there is enough consensus that a healthy lifestyle is of paramount importance. And uh, uh, to maintain healthy level of vitamin D, uh, uh, an intelligent, smart exposure to sun is necessary. Of course, a intelligent exposure, so basically not excessive. A healthy diet contributes, especially with fortified foods, and some people in certain time of the year, based on their lifestyle and their skin and many other factors, probably they need uh, to take a supplement. So uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, inadequate vitamin D status is a serum level of uh, of uh, of vitamin D uh, equal or greater than 30 nanogram ml that is 50 nanomole liter at the end of winter okay so if you at the end of winter you measure your vitamin D and is higher than 30 nanogram milliliter you are okay serum uh, vitamin D should be retested no earlier than 3 months following the commencement of supplementation with vitamin D or sun exposure or the change in the dose. And once a desiderable target of uh, vitamin D, uh, plasmatic vitamin D has been achieved, especially at the end of winter, no further testing is, is required unless risk factors change, okay? But that has to be determined by your doctor again. So let's talk about, you know, how we can produce vitamin D. Uh, uh, 
so uh, uh, sun exposure. So there is an epidemic of uh, 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 poor sun exposure uh, around the world. You know, uh, Michael Holick, that is an expert, a world expert in this topic, uh, 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 suggests that basically uh, a lot of people, they, are, uh, uh, they have uh, vitamin D uh, suboptimal levels. Uh, to maintain, uh, according to Olic, another expert, to maintain a serum vitamin D level of at least 30 nanogram ml, we should expose our arms and legs, and if possible, uh, our abdomen and back, two or three times a week to direct sunlight exposure until the skin gets a little red. It's called the uh, erythematosus uh, uh, dose. Okay. Uh, remember that you know many many glasses of our of windows, uh, the glass of our windows, they are they have a, a protection against uh, they they have a blocker, so a UV blocker. Uh, so this level of mild redness should be enough to increase uh, our blood concentration of vitamin D to a level similar to consuming 15,000 to 20,000 units of vitamin D. Of course, how many minutes we expose ourselves to sunlight to produce enough vitamin D clearly depends on the time of the day, the season, the latitude, the cloud cover, and the type of skin complexion. During winter and during summer, early in the morning or late in the afternoon, the UV ray are almost completely absorbed by the ozone layer of the atmosphere. Therefore, unless we live near the equator and in a sub-equatorial, subtropical area, most likely we need to take a vitamin D supplementation during winter to avoid deficiency uh, and uh, and uh, some estimates you know done by Olich and other suggest that uh, uh, to achieve a serum level of at least 30 nanogram ml of vitamin D uh, we need uh, uh, basically uh, around uh, 2,000 units of vitamin D if we just, you know, uh, uh, use supplements without any exposure to sun or su supplemented foods. And that is equivalent to 25% uh, of body surface exposed to a mild reddening dose of sun two or three times a week. So as you can imagine, it's a combination of food supplements, exposure to the sun, and vitamin D supplementation, okay? So you need to understand that uh, exposing only face and hands, as this paper shows, produces very little vitamin D. So, you know, here the, in, on the x-axis, uh, x you know, you see the a UVB dose in, milli, uh, in, in joules per cent, uh, square centimeters, 0, 50, 100, 150, and the production of vitamin D, uh, D, D, D uh, in the plasma. As you can see here, face and hands, small production. But, you know, if we expose the upper body, there is a much higher production and then if we expose the full body is even bigger okay so as an example in early summer a person with a fair skin who lives in new york should expose their arms and legs face and hands are not enough as you can see here to the midday sun for approximately 5 to 15 minutes two or three times a week to meet the weekly requirement of vitamin D. However, after 15 minutes, if we still want to enjoy the sun, a sunscreen with a, at least an SPF of 15 should be used in order to prevent premature skin aging, photo aging, and to reduce the risk of skin cancer. Sunburn 
is to be avoided at all costs. That's very high risk factor for skin cancer. Now, another uh, uh, underestimated point is that not only sun exposure is uh, important for producing vitamin D through the skin, but there are data suggesting, demonstrating that sunlight exposure has a protective role against uh, immune diseases and in reducing inflammation because it's improving immune function. And there is this beautiful uh, uh, review article uh, written by Hart et al., published in Nature Review Immunology in 2011, that is uh, uh, summarizing um, the mechanism through which sun exposure, independent of vitamin D, is uh, enhancing immune function and reducing the risk of uh, inflammatory autoimmune diseases. Moreover, sun exposure uh, through several mechanisms is also improving psychological and emotional well-being. Uh, the main mechanism is the production of endorphins. And interestingly, these are, these are epidemiological data. There is a study conducted in Sweden suggesting that the mortality of people who avoid who totally avoid sun exposure is almost twice as high of those who get regular but intelligent sun exposure, okay? Good. Now, very quickly, what about food and vitamin D? So there are certain foods like fatty fish, uh, cod, uh, liver cod oil, especially is very rich in vitamin D, sun-dried mushrooms, wild mushrooms, uh, contain small, small but significant amount of vitamin D. Again, fatty fish and especially uh, uh, cod liver have uh, 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 cod liver fat as a lot of vitamin D. But in general, uh, <clears throat> it has been estimated that uh, even if we consume uh, food uh, like milk or juices or cereal uh, that are uh, supplemented with vitamin D, we might achieve, you know, probably around 40% of our daily requirement uh, if we completely avoid sun exposure. So a combination of sun exposure and, and, and this uh, uh, supplemented food is important. It is important to read uh, the, 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 the uh, you know, the, the, the uh, concentration of vitamin D on these foods. Uh, a very interesting point is that uh, our diet has a powerful effect uh, in 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 uh, in uh, modulating the metabolism of vitamin D. There is this beautiful paper published in Nature Communication in 2020 by Thomas et al., showing that uh, a diet, a plant-based diet, uh, rich in fibers, so whole grain, beans, and vegetables is uh, modulating the, as we already know, and I already described in other papers, the production of short-chain fatty acids. So if you eat a, 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 a high-fiber vegetable diet, this is increasing the production of beauty rate, for example, and this beauty rate has been shown to enhance the uh, 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 transformation of the pro-hormone 25-OH vitamin D to the active form that is 125-OH vitamin D. Because again, you know, the uh, when, you know, our sun get exposed to, our skin get exposed to the sun, you know, the, the cholesterol is producing 25-OH uh, vitamin D and then in the kidney, this 25-OHD is transformed to 125-OH uh, uh, vitamin D. And again, you know, uh, these short-chain fatty acids, beauty rate in particular, that is produced by the gut microbiota of people consuming a plant-based diet is enhancing the transformation from the inactive pro-hormone to the active hormone 
that is binding to the vitamin D receptor. So very, very, very interesting, important observation. Now, let me conclude by uh, uh, giving you some numbers. Uh, these are based on the Endocrine Society clinical guidelines. Vitamin D is considered to be deficient if people that have less than 20 nanograms of, of ml of uh, uh, vitamin D, insufficient between 21 and 29, is uh, sufficient good, you know, if you have higher than 30 nanogram ml. And some people suggest that, you know, you should have higher than 40 and 50. But if, if you have higher than 30, you are fine, okay? And... Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's also important uh, uh, that uh, uh, your doctor uh, prescribes the, uh, the, 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 uh, the right laboratory assay because uh, uh, you have to ask him you know, to measure total level of uh, 25 vitamin D because some assay they're just measuring the 25 or age uh, uh, D3, um, therefore, is is extremely important. Uh, so again, as I said, it's very important that your doctor is uh, measuring the uh, total levels of twenty five uh, 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 vitamin D, and not uh, basically only the twenty five uh, OH D3. Uh, because uh, if you measure only the 25 OHD3, you could underestimate vitamin D concentrations. So again, you know, there are different criteria, different society, they are recommending uh, different level of vitamin D supplementation. Uh, for example, the EOM recommends a daily intake of vitamin D of 600 units uh, for people between one and 70 years of age and 800 in those older than 70. Uh, in, instead of the Endocrine Society International Osteoporosis Foundation recommend 800 to 2000 units per day, at least in people who have low blood levels of vitamin D. However, don't, don't, don't you know, the, your doctor should decide what is the optimal for you. Uh, but remember that uh, excessive vitamin D intake uh, supplements could uh, cause uh, cause serious problem. So there is a, a, a an upper limit that is being set to four thousand units per day for adults. For kids, is even lower. And uh, if you are exposed to excessive level of vitamin D, you basically my risk of having uh, a hypercalcemia, so elevated level of calcium in your blood that is, is, a, is a very dangerous clinical con condition and anyway excessive level of calcium in your blood can uh, increase uh, uh, vascular and tissue deposition of calcium uh, with potential damage to heart arteries and kidneys so again talk with your doctor don't prescribe don't do crazy stuff yourself you should discuss with your doctor what you should do based on your clinical and physiological condition. Once you have decided, you know, the right amount and type of supplementation, exposure to the sun, whatever, then, you know, it, you can continue without any problem to do that. And, um, and that's it. So I hope that, you know, you have, uh, that these, these uh, short, uh, uh, presentation uh, uh, is helpful uh, to understand uh, what you should do in terms of vitamin D supplementation, exposure to the sun, foods, and you know the, all the guidelines. Again, let me stress one more time, talk with your doctor. Find a good doctor who is knowledgeable and then talk with him and, and decide a plan that is good for you, is optimal for you based on your health conditions and your physiological conditions. As I said, vitamin D is only one of the many things that you should 
take care of. Uh, and uh, in this book, The Path of Longevity, I'm discussing about, about vitamin D. You can find all the references, but within a, a broad uh, 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 idea of how nutrition, different type of exercise and uh, sleep, meditation, and and the spiritual development, they are interacting in shaping a number of uh, metabolic and molecular pathways that are important for promoting health and longevity and for the prevention of multiple chronic diseases. So it's like a big puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle where you know different uh, uh, intervention, different factors, they are working together synergistically to promote health. And the idea that, you know, you take a bunch of supplements can be vitamin D or omega-3 or many other ones, NAD and resveratrol, and you're going to uh, magically live long and healthy is basically not supported by scientific evidence. And randomized clinical trial are clearly showing like in this instance where, you know, people, they thought, you know, that vitamin D supplementation or C or vitamin E was the solution for the prevention of cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, and the randomized clinical trial, they clearly demonstrated that it was not the case, that the association, the study in animals and the, and, the, and, and the epidemiological studies, they were misleading. And when, you know, we perform randomized clinical trials, the results, they were not supportive of uh, what uh, people thought. And, uh, um, and so uh, you should, you know, really study and get the best knowledge to make informed decisions. And so these are basically some material that if you wish you can study, you know, to get a better understanding of the science of longevity. And uh, in probably in December, uh, a new book of mine, uh, The Manual of Healthy Longevity and Wellbeing is gonna be published by Hardy Grant. And in this book, uh, I, I have all outlined a number of recipes and exercises and mindfulness practices that people can implement, you know, because this is a theoretical book. This is a more practical book because a lot, a lot of people who have read this book, they told me, yeah, but, you know, very interesting information. But then what should I eat? How can I combine healthy recipes to improve my health uh, uh, without, you know, sacrificing taste and uh, what type of exercise I can do at home. And, uh, and, and, and so uh, I said to write this manual, this practical manual to help people, to guide people. But again, these books are just general. You always need to talk with your doctor to make informed decision based on your health status and your physiological and, and, and disease status. Thank you for listening as always. Bye now.